Hello, I'm Jeremy, and today I'm going to be talking about a game by the name of Okavango. This is a family game for two to four players, ages 10 and up. Plays in about 30 to 45 minutes, and it's designed by Wolfgang Kramer and Michael Kiesling, who are two of my favorite board game designers. Uh, it's published by Jumbo in a multi-language um, edition. This has English, German, I think French and Spanish in it. Um, uh, and it is uh, you know, available in Europe. I had to import a copy of it. And this is a game in which players are going to be playing forest rangers who are trying to lead animals to drinking, uh, wa to drinking water, uh, scoring points for doing that. So it's a relatively abstract game. It's almost um, driven largely by numbers. It's, players are going to be placing out animal tiles, but really they have a number on it, and that's the important thing. But... Um, it's at the same time uh, relatively unique. Um, I would say, even though it's a tile game, it's a, it feels like a hand management game. Uh, I'll take a few minutes to explain how it works. It takes a few minutes to kind of wrap your head around it. And then I will come back and let you know what I think about the game. So I've set up here a two-player game of Okavango. Uh, these are the player areas down here. This is essentially a river that functions as a market. And then there are these areas where players are going to be playing tiles. These are going to be uh, watering holes and these are river tiles down here. So each of these uh, tiles is going to have spaces where animals could be sent, and by sending people, or sending animals to these spaces, players are going to be able to score. You'll notice that these tiles have on them a certain number of white spaces and then a number of uh, darkened spaces. Uh, if ever when sending animals, you cover up all of the white spaces, you can, and you'll only be able to send you know, one animal per space. If ever you cover up all the white spaces after you've sent your, your animals, then you'll score the number of points that's on this mask at the top of the tile. So, for example, if you sent at least two animals to this tile, then you would score two points. Uh, you could only, however, send up to four. You can't place an animal here if there's no space for it. So, you can see that some of the other tiles, like this watering hole, for example, has space for nine with eight of them being lightened. So you'd have to send at least eight animal tiles to this. And on these watering holes, you have to send them all of the same type in order to score 10 points. Then at the bottom of the uh, play area, there are these river tiles, and there's three of these. And these function sort of similarly, with the exception that whereas you have to send all of the same type of animal to one of the watering holes, the rivers require you to send all different animals. So one tile will start on there at the uh, start of the game on each of those tiles and you could send let's say you sent two you would then score two points however if you sent three you would score three points if you sent all four you would score four points. Um, what the thing about these tiles is whenever they're completed they will flip over and no longer be available any animal tiles out are on them will go back into the draw bag so that is uh, a wrinkle in those, whereas these are not you know, two-sided. These will remain in play throughout the game. So the game goes with players sending those, their animals from their player boards to these areas in order to try to trigger those scorings um, and also ideally collect more animal tiles for their future turns. So it has a couple of unique mechanisms um, in order to do that. There's also over here, I should say, a scoring track. This is how players are going to keep score. And then at the uh, top of the uh, board here, or at the top of the play area, there is this uh, market where players are going to be able to draft tiles from at the end of their turn. So, uh, randomly, players are going to get 13 tiles to start. You'll place one animal tile on each of these tiles, and then you'll add 13 uh, tiles to the market. Uh, players will normally have a player screen. I've just kept them flat for the purposes of the demonstration. And there's also a start player token, this uh, tribal mask, which one player will randomly get and they'll retain throughout the game just to ensure that players get an equal number of turns when the end game is triggered. So on a player's turn what they're going to be able to do is they are going to send animals from behind their screen and again these are going to be kept secret normally to any one of these tiles. So you can see this player you know luckily got four giraffe tiles so they could send them to you know for example this space here, which has four white spaces on it. That would enable them to score this four points. So the rules when you're sending animals to one of these watering holes are that you have to send all of the same type of animal, um, and then you have to beat 
essentially the animals that are there. So right now there's a one animal here with a nine and there's two ways that you could beat that. You could either uh, play a higher animal. So this player could just, for example, send this lion here. That would displace the leopard here, which would go back to that player because it's essentially had its water. It's filled, it could go, you know, it could go, it's done drinking. The player gets that tile. Um, however, if they, you know, so like I said, you could either play a higher number or you could play a high, high, and by number I mean higher rank of tile. So if there were, let's say, two number nines here, two number 11s would beat two number nines. So you could play the same number of tiles with higher ranks, or you could play any number or a larger number of tiles where the rank will not matter. So for example, if this one nine was on here, this player, if they had, for example, two threes, that would displace a nine because it's a greater number of tiles. So you have to either beat the rank or beat the number of tiles or both in order to place on here. So if this player just played this 11, like I said, in order to score the points at the top of the tile, you have to be able to cover up all of the white spaces. So that would not enable them to score. Tactically, there's some reasons why you might want to do that. Uh, just perhaps you really need that tile or you don't have any, you know, you're setting up, you know, for another scoring opportunity. Um, but generally, if possible, I would say you'd want to score those points. So in that case, you know, to displace this, this nine leopard, this player might choose to send out four giraffes. So let me just put this back down and they would just place them on there. Since the, um, number of animals is covering up all of the white spaces on that tile. They'll get the points at the top, which is four points, so that red would just score four points there. Um, so again, they would get the nine. They would be able to add that to their display. And then they get to refill um, from the market up here. So you can see here there are stacks of animals. And you're going to be able to take uh, essentially one stack of animals and put them back behind your, sc your screen. The rules for this are almost the inverse of the placement rules for here. So when you're taking these, you could either take uh, the same number of tiles. So you could take four tiles, if there were four tiles in a stack, of a lower rank, so five or below. Or the player would be able to um, take a lesser number of tiles and then rank would not matter at all. So they, for, for example, could take these three eights with one move uh, because three is fewer than four tiles they would then also add them to their board, or behind their screen, rather. So after any player takes tiles from there, you'll refill that market to 13. So they would be able to place, you know, there's a wild there, there's a nine and an eight. And then it would be the next player's turn. So I should say that if ever there are wilds out here, and the wilds could be placed as part of any set, so this could be a fifth giraffe if the player had played that alongside it. Um, you could choose to take one wild and that's even if there's several wilds stacked there. So you could always take just one and just one wild uh, at the end of your turn um, in lieu of taking a stack of animals. So now would be the green player's turn. So the green player, let's say they have, um, you know, it's a, a giant hodgepodge here and this would not necessarily be the uh, greatest move, but maybe they would want to send to one of these river tiles. The rules for sending to these river tiles are different. Instead of sending animals of the same type, you have to send animals of different types. And you can see that they have scoring opportunities based on how full the river is. So again, the first space is blank. If you cover up all of the blanks, the white, the, uh, white spaces, I suppose, uh, you'll score that number of points. But if you cover up green, more and more green spaces, spaces, you'll score great, a greater number of points. So if you covered all five of these, for example, you would get five points. But they have to be all different animal types. So let's say that this player wanted to send animals here. Maybe they would just send a monkey and, you know, an elephant. And they might just do that. And that would score them two points. If they chose to send a third animal, they would get three points. They would get to take the giraffe that was already there and add it to their board, just like always. And um, if the, however, if they sent a fourth animal there, let's say they did that, they would get four points, but then as soon as one of these is completely filled, any animals that are there are going to go back into the bag, and then this is going to get turned over. Essentially, they've depleted, they've dried out that river. So 
it won't be available again for the rest of the game. So let's say the, the green player sent four animals there for four points. Um, then because they sent four animals here, they would be able to take a stack of up to three. They don't need to worry about the ranks of the animals. They just get to take uh, fewer animals than they sent. So they could, for example, take these three zebras, um, add those to their supply, and then three tiles would co come out. So as players play this game, um, they are going to be working on creating sets of like animals because uh, in order to place onto these larger spaces here, you'll need you know eight animals in order to score that 10 points. And the game end, end doesn't come until every one of these tiles is scored. You know there are only blank or dark spaces or no spaces showing on every one of these tiles here or that you know the rivers have been flipped over. So, Essentially, players are going to sometimes make moves. For example, maybe this player, they already have four elephants. Maybe they're working on elephant scoring. They might make the decision to send, for example, two leopards here to this. That would get them this elephant that got displaced. They wouldn't score these eight points because they have um, unoccupied white tiles here. But then, because they sent over two nines, they could take then two eights from the uh, board, so now all of a sudden they're up to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven elephants um, for their set. And then, you know, normally, like normally, this would refill, so you'd have, you know, two tens come out. So, now this player, on their, their next turn, they would have seven elephants, so for example, they would be able to displace that, place the uh, seven elephants on here, score eight points, and then they would get, you know, two, two leopards, as well as up to seven tiles from up there if there was all one stack that had that many tiles in it which is tends to be rare so essentially this game just involves you know a set collection aspect but also like a hand management aspect insofar as you never want to uh make big plays so early that you deplete your so your source of animals here so if on the you know in the next turn this player played out all seven of their animals to that to that space here That'd be great that they got the eight points, but they would only get back the one tile or, or two tiles that they're displacing, plus maybe a few more. So they would have laid out seven tiles to maybe get only five. So players have to make sure that they have a number of tiles here uh, to be able to make future placements because as these fill up and as these numbers get higher, it's going to become increasingly difficult to place out onto these boards. And like I said, these boards will eventually flip over as they're filled up. So I, I would say that that's generally the uh, way the game's going to keep going until, like I said, there are no white spaces visible at the end of any, any player's turn. You'll finish out the round until the player to the left of the start player uh, has their last turn. Then whoever has the most points is the winner. Okay, so that's Okavango. And... I think that this is a really uh, enjoyable family game. However, it's one that I think is going to throw a lot of players who go into it expecting something that's going to be largely driven by the animal uh, theme. It's, to me, a relatively abstract game. It's a lot drier than it might initially appear to be. Uh, the Like I said, there are animal tiles on that players are playing, but the animals are almost irrelevant compared to the number on the tile. For me, that's not at all a problem. However, for some players, they might be disappointed that it's a relatively abstract, almost a card game, uh, despite the fact that it you know, takes up an entire board. Um, and the, you know, the, the idea of leading animals to a savanna is relatively uh, secondary to you know, looking at, you know, how can I beat you know, a set of threes with a set of fives? So, in, I, guess, I guess I should mention that this game ha bears a great resemblance to uh, Linko, which is another game by the same designers, Kramer and Kiesling. Uh, this is just a straightforward card game, which is almost entirely abstract. Um, it's, a, it's a really great uh, card game. I should you know, emphasize that. Highly recommended. Um, and this uses you know, a similar... It's definitely not like a, a direct translation into a board game form, but it feels similar in a lot of regards. For example, in the ways that you know suits beat other suits, uh, a lot of those mecha mechanics have been translated over, I think, to this game. So I wouldn't be surprised if they came out of the same you know brainstorming session. Um, 
But back to Okavango, which I, I believe in in spite of you know the you know somewhat half their theme, um, is an interesting game, and it's one that I think rewards uh, clever play and risk management. Um, some you know building up that big set to get that big score um, is going to take a lot of intermediary steps. So there's some strategic element to to that. Uh, and also uh, thinking about when you're going to be able to play, uh, you know, partially in a way that keeps the space vulnerable for another player to come in there and also gain those points uh, versus playing more tiles just to lock it down is another strong strategic consideration. When I talked about the rules, I don't think I necessarily talked about the uh, Joker tiles to a great extent. I don't recall doing that. And these, um, you know, they also exist in Linko, the card game version. Uh, but the way that these work is that uh, if they are out on the field, a player could play the animal that's standing in for and claim the Joker tile, and then they could you know either use it in the set that they're about to play, or they can um, just you know retain it to help build their set. So it's not necessarily super deterministic that that you have to have every single tile because there's only eight of each animal tile. It's not deterministic that you have to have to have every tile in order to get you know the eight set for ten points, which is the biggest scoring opportunity in the game, because those Joker tiles are in there. The I guess the caveat is you can only claim one Joker tile per turn by swapping it out, even if there are multiple on the board. So the game, I think um, it. I should also mention, I suppose that. It plays very differently. It's a two to four player game. It plays much quicker than I expected, especially after my first play. The first time I played, I played it. We were essentially v being very timid in trying to build perfect sets before we would play to score, um, and the game took a little bit longer as a result. Um, but you know, subsequent games, people have have been more you know willing to just, you know, go dangerously low on their tiles in hopes that they could get some later, which could really speed up the game. The box has 45 minutes. I think, realistically, it's more of a 30-minute game. Um, also, uh, the number of players. Uh, the game plays very differently with four players or three players or two players. It scales well. It's just it's a different experience. With two players, uh, there's more tiles in the bag. There's going to be essentially... Uh, more play, you know, more turns for each player, so there's going to be more of a sense that you're slowly building your engine, whereas it with four players, uh, very quickly players are going to start, you know, claiming, you're going to have fewer turns, lower scores, and it's going to be less of an arc to the game, it'll be more of a rapid fire thing, and three is somewhere in between, so I've played it the three different counts, I think it works at all three different counts, but um, I think this is Probably something that I would say I prefer at two player just because it gives you more of that arc, more chance to to build up you know your sets of animals and plan and react to what the other player is doing. I wouldn't say it's necessarily chaotic at um, four, but there is a greater chance of you having you know say five animal tiles and then you know three turns later you don't have a place for them to go, which could really throw a wrench into your works. So. Um, in all, I think that this is you know a game that most people will enjoy as if they are introduced to it. Maybe as you know, somewhat you know, an abstract game, almost more of a card game, a set collection game. It's almost a, almost more like Rummy than you know an adventure game or something of that sort. So with appropriate or accurate expectations, um, I would definitely recommend that people give it a try. Um, I enjoy it. I think that's distinct enough from Linko that I could, you know, justify playing a game that's slightly longer and uh, justify keeping it in my collection just because it has more of a, a strategic um, element to it. You could plan out um, more than just your initial starting hand. You could plan, you know, how am I going to turn A into B to C here, which is something that's very difficult to do in Linko where you're really just working with your base cards. Um, so I guess overall, you know, it's a recommended game. Uh, you know, Cromer and Kiesling are a terrific design duo, and uh, they've come through again, I think. And um, yeah, I would encourage you to check out uh, Okavango. Thanks for watching.